Thank you, Zach, and thanks to all of you for coming back this weekend. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see so many uh, good old friends of Millbury College, and the fact that we're here to celebrate one of those dearest friends, Hugh Marlin, makes this uh, a special occasion. It's bittersweet, to be sure, but one that will certainly be memorable for all of us. And I'm, I'm pleased to have been asked to say a few words this evening. Where and how can one begin to describe the one and only Hugh Marlowe? <laughs> the best attempt I ever heard came from an alum, maybe someone in this audience, I, I, I simply don't remember who, uh, who said simply in trying to define, trying to describe Hugh Marlowe, Hugh Marlowe is a force of nature. <laughs> I think the definer must be over this one. Not bad, and, and pretty darn close to the mark. So try Googling force of nature. You'll find references to earthquakes, tsunamis, cyclones, Typhoons, <laughs> you will find these definitions. A person or creation possessing unnatural powers, gravitation, electromagnetism, strong force and weak force. You will find a romantic comedy film. You will find songs by like Pearl Jam and the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> Only one definition is missing. You are wrong. <laughs> Indescribable, undefinable, but as a former Supreme Court Associate Justice once famously put it, I know it when I see it. <laughs> Over almost 30 years, with you, we have seen it, and we know it indelible images walking around the dining room at red loaf keeping coffee cups filled you could eat later officers eat last down on your hands and knees in the front yard at three south street deadheading dandelions broom in hand sweeping the sidewalk or a porch and then Zach talked about mealtime outings. And I'm reminded of a famous mealtime incident that occurred in Chinatown in New York City. <laughs> After the holiday reception in December of 1990, uh, I wasn't president then, uh, and I didn't know that I would ever be president, though a year later, I was, <laughs> and the current president decided that after the holiday reception, we should take the staff out to dinner in Chinatown. So we went, and we had a great meal, and we had a wonderful time. And at the meal's conclusion, the waiter came up and presented the check. And the president, being gracious and generous and magnanimous, reached into his wallet and pulled out a credit card and said, I'll take care of this. And we were all exceedingly grateful until the waiter said, I'm sorry, sir, we don't take credit cards. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> well, what to do? Um, we all looked around, how much do you have in your wallet? Well, how much do you have in your wallet? Well, we ended it up. To the rescue. Came Hugh Marlowe, briefcase full. <laughs> this is no lie. <laughs> of the proceeds <laughs> from the alumni reception. <laughs> we almost didn't invite him, and thank goodness we did. <laughs> The waiter was only somewhat nonplussed as 
you reached into the roof case and briefcase and took out a wad of cash <laughs> sufficient to keep the higher administration at Middlebury from having to wash dishes <laughs> for the rest of the night. Uh, diplomacy was served, our reputations were secured, the bill was paid, and it's all thanks to the ever resourceful Dewey Marlowe. <laughs> been the official presence at weddings and funerals and occasions beyond measure where the Middlebury College extended family has gathered in moments of joy and sadness and moments like this which partake of both. You Marlowe, hands swift to welcome in the words of the old hymn and arms to embrace the face the smile the presence the reassurance of Middlebury college ubiquitous presence among the extended family more nights on the road than anyone could count and goodness knows we spent a lot of those times together and you spent a good many more than that making introductions and connections explaining elaborate relationships and complicated genealogies. So-and-so is his cousin and was here in the class three years before this guy, and you really need to talk to so-and-so because they're both. And before you leave, you need to speak to that guy over there because he's doing what they, we, we, we've all seen. Force of nature. Not a fundraiser, but a consummate friendraiser. And a great sense of humor. One evening after a successful event in California, uh, the spouse of our alumni host, uh, clearly uh, at least exhausted, uh, after a long evening of meeting and greeting, uh, offered this apparent maloprop. You, he said, if I've learned anything in life, it's that money can't buy loneliness. <laughs> Makes one almost think the drinking age should be 75. <laughs> Dog expression. Money, money can't buy lonely. Well, we, we both sat there just chortling, uh, not sure whether the speaker meant to make a joke or offer a complaint. Uh, but we both agreed to file the aphorism away, and at long last I found an occasion to use it. <laughs> Breakfasts, lunches, dinners, receptions, games, lectures. Concerts, tours, this down. man has logged the miles and put in the hours, it and we do it frequently, have said thank you. Tonight, we do just that. Get more. Over the course of the last century, it has fallen to a very Smart. small handful of Middlebury alumni okay. to stake legitimate claim to the title inscribed on the cake that we're all now enjoying, the title of Mr. Milbury. Because they served so long, and cared so deeply, and thought so little of self, and gave all that they had. There was Capwack, class of 1913, who served the administration of this college for a very long time until his retirement in the early 50s in admissions and placement and development and alumni affairs and student affairs. Cap Wiley was Mr. Middlebury in his time. And then there was Gordy Perrine, class of 1949. Just like He filled those shoes in the same way. Gordy held just about every job there was 
at Middlebury College. Gordy was the go-to guy when alumni had a question or a problem or a complaint or needed some special attention. The president was an interesting person to talk to. Gordy was the guy they called. <laughs> and joining that very small and glittering constellation of Mr. Middlebury's is Hugh Marlin, who has more than earned his place in that small and distinguished company. Hugh, you, you are indeed a force of nature. <laughs> and you are also the repository of so much of our institutional memory. You have been our college's troubadour. And you've been successful because you don't just know the words. You know the music. Knowing the music is what has made you so effective and what has made you so beloved. You're one of a kind, my friend, <coughs> but you're the genuine article. Mr. Middlebury, once and for all time, thank you, Hugh.